So for week 10 of summer anime, we start with The God of High School, episode 10. And now we, the previous episode, we see that Jin Mori's team uh, successfully advances to the next round. And in this round that they will fight the, um, the team with the other guy that's like friends with Jin Mori. And then the other team, uh, we got a backstory um, of the guy's girl. Her name is Sangwon, and then, like, back in the day, she was fighting Jaggle, the blue-haired kind of shark-looking guy, and he was a savage back then, too, because he um, beat her up in the, like, sanctioned martial arts fight, but then he kind of goes to the next level and cripples her. I don't know why this was legal, why this guy wasn't arrested, but yeah, that's the world we live in, so now she's, she's all right. She just, like, can't fight again. And that really angers um, the other guy, Park. So then, yeah, we get that good backstory. Also, we learned that the name of the organization that tried to um, sabotage the God of High School tournament, uh, their name is Knox. So Knox is like the evil group, I guess. And then now we start off with the match with um, Han Day. Uh, which is and Park Sangwa. So Hande is like the big muscular dude and Park Sangwa is also a big muscular girl. So like this is kind of a dream matchup. It's very um, brawly focused. You can feel the power of their blows. Good animation for this one. And it wasn't even like an important fight. It was just like a, like Hande won kind of like. Um, like they were even at first but Hande has like a. He has like his um his turtle technique. Or, like, he, he has this water turtle technique, but then, um, the girl Park Sangwa, her, her technique was basically kind of disorient Hande. So then, like, if he, if she punched him in the ear, and he got all dizzy, but then, um, like, Han, Han overpowered her with the turtle, the, whatever the, his water technique is, but yeah. Like, Han is kind of OP in this, uh, in this team, so props to him. Also, after that, um, after Hande beats, um, Park, then, like, the big muscle girl, then, um, we get a little bit more story with, there are these black robed figures just surrounding the city streets, and then they're standing in the middle of the city, they, they like, summon a giant summon sword, they're summoning, like, a god, like, maybe a Choi Reki god or something, but it's just, like, some weird ritual they're doing, these black robed figures. I think that's Knox. And then, um, after that, like, I think the moderators for the God of High School, they were, they were doing, like, they were fighting against, against these evil people. And then, um, there's, like, this music, strong, like, string, violin type of music, harmonica dude. There's, like, this drunk guy who's, like, he's, he's just, he's just, like, playing the guitar while fighting. It's just, it is like the orchestra was kind of out of this world. So then, even though the story is convoluted, the music is solid. Okay, also, we also have round two of the of the God of High School fight. So, um, Han Day beat the girl, the muscle, muscle girl. So now this one is Jin Mori versus Park Ippo. And Park is kind of a... He's like, he's kind of a friend to Jin Mori, but he's also like a, a good rival. Like, they're kind of equal in standing. Also... I don't know who the third member of Park Ippo's team is, like, so I'm assuming Jin just wins this one, like, by default, because we don't even know who the third member is, probably not relevant. So yeah, we have, um, we have them in one of, like, the sickest fights of the season. Uh, I don't think it's the best fight, like, of the season, but it's really sick, where we have, um, Jin, like, he's being countered, like, Jin is usually, like, the like the hyperactive like fast and powerful guy but he's been countered so park is really smart he knows his like techniques how to like counter him he says oh you're you're bad at close combat oh he's like oh you have three weaknesses you're bad at close combat your techniques use too much energy and your moves are really obvious like i can tell what you're doing pretty easily so then jin mar is like fuck you like i don't care <laughs> then he hits him with the jin mori original yeah, I think this is the number two original, which is the twin blue dragon kick. And this was sick, because 
Park Ippo, he was like, he brought his own technique, which is the Taekwon Blazing Cyclone Blade, which is like, I don't know, the Blazing Cyclone Blade, like, he just kicks his feet, and it's like this big fire, so then his, um, fire kick matches with, uh, Jin Mori's blue kick, and then they kind of make a big shockwave and cancel each other out, so they're evenly matched, but Ippo is just like, he seems to be a little bit more skilled than Jin Mori. Like, he just probably had, like, a bit more training, like, one or two years. But then if, like, Jin Mori was, like, had two more years of training, like, he'd probably beat Park. So, but right now they're, like, Park is kind of, like, a higher level um, at him than him. But then, um, Jin, he, Jin did some wild shit, which I did not expect, uh, kind of a shonen. Well, it's not really a shonen, but, like, uh, action protagonist to do, where he copies his friend's moves so then he pulls out the moon sword style um which is a uh, yomira's technique so he does like a like a cut like from her her like fighting style with, with his like hand so that was like like damn he, he's copying techniques and he also uses Hande's black turtle stance like the defensive um or like rocky rock stance to attack so it's like he he has he has some moves now. He has, he's like copying other people's moves, so he's getting a little bit more powerful. And then it is it's kind of strange because he's getting stronger every fight, but he, like he copied his friend's moves, that seems kind of unfair. Anyway, after that they they pull out an ultimate move. Like you thought the uh, Jin Mori original was was OD, then this one is like even more. So then he does the Blue Dragon Tempest. Jin Mori Original 3, Blue Dragon Tempest. That's such a mouthful. But then um, Park Ippo fires back. He has the Hellfire Blade, which is like another flaming kick. So then their their attacks kind of um, collide, but then we get a flashback in the middle of it. Where um, we, we see Park Ippo meeting uh, baby Jin Mori. So like Park was probably 5 years old and Jin Mori was like 2 or 3. And then... um. Park also sees the grandfather, and the grandfather asks, um, if you see my grandson ever again, try to teach him something. And then, yeah, that's it. But then, uh, Jin Mori seems to win this, uh, collision. And then, um, so that's cool. Jin Mori wins. But then, like, Park Ippo's, like, watch, um, like, life band goes to negative one GP. And I, rem I remember GP is God Point, so it's not really explained too well, but yeah, it's negative one, so it's like, is he dead? Is he, like, like what's happening to him? And then he turns into a furry, like a nine-tailed fox-looking furry, like white fox type of design, and then, it, oh, whatever, bro, you're, you're a furry, good, good for you. <laughs> but then, yeah, apparently he's super powerful, and then it's just like the key is awakened, so he's like... He's, like, the key that they're looking for, like, the Choireki. Like, he's, like, I guess, like, the final piece of the puzzle. So, we'll see if it gets explained next episode, but damn. Uh, a lot of good action. So, I'll give it I'll give it that good action and music for this okay, episode. Okay, so, for RE0, episode 10, we start off with um, what we saw last episode. Just, like, ASMR, I love you, from the Witch Satella. Just, like, mind-fucking Subaru. The whole world is covered in shadows. They're trying to get away. And then the Subaru is like... Suffering. And then the witch kind of tries to overtake him. And Subaru's just spitting. He's like, Bro, I'd rather love the other witches than you. Like, I love Amelia more than you. Like, you you ain't shit. And then she gets all angry. But then, um... Before she kind of tries to absorb Subaru, he kills himself. With, like, the handkerchief that um, Echidna gave him in the tea party. So apparently the handkerchief was, like, magicked into, like, being, like, a fail-safe escape device. Which is pretty cool. Okay, yo, waifu points for Echidna right there. And then um, we see... We see um, Amelia um, and Subaru meet up in the trial uh, room. And then, yeah, everything's happily ever after. No one's dead now. Everyone's chilling. Okay, so then after that, we get some backstory, um, which is pretty cool. The Ryuzu's, the little, like, short girl that's kind of mysterious. We kind of find out that she's a copy. She's a clone. 
and then they're doing like there's there's the real Ryuzu body encased in ice in some uh, laboratory, um, Echidna's lab, I guess it was, and then the corpses like, or I mean the copies like purpose, is to fill them with like memories, personality, knowledge. It's kind of like a build a bear, like a Barbie like you, you Barbie dream house. They're making these like girls and they're like filling them with whatever. I guess the goal is to gain immortality, but then the um the witch of greed, Echidna can't really fit into the body, so her like, I mean like the witch of greed is too powerful to fit in the body, so the experiment with Ryuzu is kind of a failure. It doesn't really work for her. So then that's yeah we get the we get the story of that. Also Ryuzu kind of tells uh, Subaru that um. If you have Echidna's, like, DNA, hair, or something inside you, the Ryuzu will listen to you. And then that's really important, because that explains why um, the Ryuzu's listen to Garfield. He also has some type of uh, DNA of uh, Echidna, so, like, we don't really know how he got this DNA. So I guess we'll find out soon. So Subaru and Amelia have, like, some nice moonlight get-together moment where they support each other. It's like we we've seen this a hundred times. Like okay, yeah, you're in pain. Like we'll we'll so we'll go together, support each other, overcome all the evils, do all the trials, etc. And then um we get a cool anime moment at the end where Subaru's like, oh I have to go to the mansion, to like figure shit out. But then Garfield was like, bruh, yo something wrong with you. You're acting suspicious. Like Garfield has his own agenda. And then. They go back and forth, try to, like, talk to each other. Garfield's, like, aggressive. He's like, yo, you are you don't know shit. Like, what what the fuck you doing? And Subaru, Subaru challenges him. He's like, I've seen hell. I know, I know a lot of shit. Subaru kind of dominates him with facts and logic. And just, like, like... You know, like, Subaru can do this because he knows he won't die. But he basically, like, dares him. Like, bro, I dare you to, like do something and Garfield's like bro why are you throwing your life away are you so like confident so I mean like their uh their back and forth was pretty nice and then it shows like Subaru has like big balls also we see Bieko at the end she's um I guess she's gonna do something like she's a uh, she's a pretty key player she probably has some secret hidden power to help Subaru with the situation we'll see so this episode is pretty, like, it's kind of a cool-down episode to explain what happens, how stuff is going, and yeah, that's it for RE0. Okay, now for Decadence, episode 10, we get the, um, realization from Natsume. She finds out that, yeah, this whole world is kind of manufactured, everything, the, um, god, the gadols that they just killed weren't, weren't even, like, real, they were created. And then she kind of passes out from knowing that her whole world is kind of like a Matrix type of simulation. Like, like, damn, like, I mean, I don't blame her, like, this is just pretty crazy to find out. Like, it was hinted throughout the, the story, like, even the boss kind of wanted to tell her, but now it's revealed. She's kind of sad now, like, her whole purpose basically is, like, fucked. She wanted confidence. She wanted, like, freedom, and wanted to make her own choices. Like, she wanted to kind of explore the world. Not, not explore the world, but, like, kind of protect people, just do it her own way. But then she realizes, like, she doesn't have any freedom. This is, like, just, the world is just, like, messed up. So her and Boss kind of have a falling out. Everyone's sad. But then uh, Kura and I, she's kind of, like, MVP. She sees her. Kura and I consoles her. She kind of tells her that, hey, everyone has their own opinions. Everyone has their own experiences. No one should tell you how you feel. Just like, just like, you know, if you're if you're sad or depressed, you know, that that's your own world. She does she does like a good speech to kind of motivate um, Natsume. So then um, Natsume also reads the letter. Like boss sends her a letter that hey I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy uh, this decadence type of uh, simulation myself. I'm gonna try to destroy the company. And then, um, I'll do it myself with my squad. Like, you you can do your own thing. Like, I'm sorry to kind of hit you with this big-ass, like, truth bomb. 
But then Natsume is like, bruh, I, you don't need to do this. Like, I, I was just being emotional. I'm good now. I'll, like, I'll work with you. We can destroy Decadence together. So then as they make up in the end, the boss gets fucking killed. Stabbed in the heart. He gets Kakyoin by, uh, by the Dio guy with the Raven. The, like, the direct... I have, like, the dude who runs the Decadence, um, bug hunting. But then, um, yeah, the boss isn't really killed, but then... Natsume might actually be killed because she's a human, so... If, uh, if he attacks her, like, it's gonna be yikes moment. There's also a big kaiju that appears at the end. So, I thought all the god all were defeated, but apparently this big-ass kaiju is gonna be the boss. Um, the final boss we see, they fight. So yeah, cool episode of Decadence, we learn a lot. We get good emotional moments, and uh, they're progressing to, like, a big uh, final confrontation showdown as they, uh, destroy the Decadence. So I'm excited to see how this anime will um, end up. So for Fire Force season two, episode 11, we kind of get a cool down episode as they end the arc of going to China and finding the information on the Amaterasu last episode. Here they give a rundown to the uh, Commander Obi. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of sad because they just basically say, Oh, this information that the church is lying, that the power source for the Amaterasu is actually, like, a person. It's gonna shake up the whole country, so you gotta, like, you gotta chill with it. Like, the church is saying, oh, let give us three years to reevaluate, and then we can tell the public. Which is kind of a letdown, because this big information now has to be covered up. Iris is also really sad, because... She's a, she's a priest, and then, like, her whole world is just, like, shaken. Like, what what, what does she believe now? But then, um, Obi kind of consoles her. She's like, hey, it's, it's gonna, he's like, it's gonna be all right. Like, well, we'll figure it out. And then Shinra has, like, a, a shonen protagonist moment where he's like, I gotta, like, protect Iris. Like, we gotta, we gotta find the truth so, like, no one gets hurt or sad. And we know what the fuck is going on. So then we go to Joker and licked it's kind of focused towards them and this is cool because like we really did not like we really need more joker sections he's so cool but he's he's just been in the back like doing his own thing but now he's like in the focus now so then the joker kind of considers himself an anti-hero he calls himself the dark hero <laughs> so like that's um that's that's like he, he has his own like mental state where, like, like Shenra thinks of him as a hero, but Joker's the dark hero. So then, um... We get a tiny bit of Lick backstory even before this, where... He's, like, he's a pretty good scientist. He's doing research on human combustion. Like, he gets praised and stuff. But he doesn't think his work right now is, like... Important, consequential. It's, it's just, like... He, he doesn't know why he's doing what he's doing. So then... Yeah, this kind of shows his motivation of trying to uncover the truth his own way. Um, so yeah, he's doing he's doing stuff his own way. He just wants to know the truth. And he doesn't think that the fire soldiers... Like, he thinks the fire soldiers have, like, done all they could. Now it's up to him to, to do underground shady research. Also, the Joker and Benny Maru team up, which is very crazy. Did not expect this team up at all. And then, um, I did read the manga, though, so, like, I, I know what happens, but, like, even when I read the manga, it, like, this team-up was insane, unexpected, but Benny Maru kind of is like, yeah, fuck it, I'll follow you, because Joker's like, oh, I know you hate the church, so I know you want to know what kind of is going on, so then, yeah, they, there's a funny moment where they two go to the big, um, church building, it's, like, the, the headquarters of the Holy Soul Temple, and then they're overlooking the building across the street, I guess, on top of another building. And then Benny Mars like, hey, why do we have to climb up here? We have to go down anyway. And then Joker's like, because heroes go on buildings. <laughs> like, the heroes have to stand on top or whatever. So then, yeah, the Joker's pretty funny. And then the Holy Soul Temple actually has a really cool design. It's like this big white 
Empire State looking tall church building. I don't know why a church building needs to be this big, but that's how it is. And then after that, we see like Joker and Benny Maru just crashing in the gate. Just like beating up all these guards. Apparently, they're elite guards, but they, they, they look so ugly. Their haircut is like this uh, coconut bowl cut. But then the top, they're bald. So they're completely bald up here. But then they have like the coconut hair around here. It looks, it looks really bad. But then um, apparently they're elite guards. But then, you know, Benny Maru and Joker just style on them. Benny Maru does his like, like his style, his Demon Slayer type of number attack style. And then um, Joker does, we don't really know what Joker's power is yet. But he has like some type of smoke power. He can like suffocate people. And then he has this like, a uh, fire card so he has like smoke and fire cards that that's like his power so then yeah a although at the end something funny happens um benny maru gets blindsided by sneak attack and then this big ass um uh holy soul temple guard uh comes out and joker i mean benny maru is basically incapacitated and joker's like damn that's pretty lame <laughs> so then yeah i guess we'll see it the next episode how joker deals with this um, muscular new um, new enemy guard, I guess. He's not really a boss like character, so I guess like Joker will beat him no problem. But I don't know. <laughs> he made he made such an impact uh, knocking out Benny Maru like that. Okay, so for Rent a Girlfriend, episode ten this week, we had um a little bit of fun seeing Kazuya and Ruka um, together at their uh, karaoke job. Um, they have good dynamic together where, well, it's kind of abusive because Ruka is just like, damn, you got to listen to me um, or I'll dock your pay. Like she, she puts the charms on the boss and then <laughs> she, she wants to get closer to him, etc. So yeah, she's a little manipulative, but well, we'll see if she's still, she's still, she's still innocent Ruka there with like her heart condition. Also, we find out, um, because Kazuya's friends kind of troll him at the job. Uh, they enter the karaoke booth. But then, um, they tell him that the other friend, um, Ruka's old, like, rent rental, um, rental dude, like, Kazuya's friend, he's, um, depressed now. Like, he hates women, he's heartbroken. He's making, like, these shady tweets, like, uh, like about how depressed he is. So then, um, Kazuya kind of, uh, like, the, the nice guy he is, he has to... He has to help him out. So then um, he makes a little plan where he um, he can't obviously go to go to him and apologize himself because then um, the guy would be like, yo, that's the, like you have a girlfriend. You never understand my pain. Like, just stop. So then he he pays Mizuhara. His, uh, he uses his newly earned karaoke money to uh, get Mizuhara to go on a, a amusement park date with him. So then uh, he kind of uh, opens up a little, like is uh, is is a little more chill. So then he's he's on guard though, like first, like the guy, because he is um, let me let me find out that guy's name because, like, god goddamn, I cannot keep calling him the guy. His name is Sean. Sean, okay, Sean. So Sean is. Sean is like on guard. He's like this could be a prank. Like, you know, I can't trust her. But then. Like, it, it, it's cool because he opens up at the end. Like, there, Mizuhara is, like, really good at, like, being a fake girlfriend. She's very understanding, like, open. And she's good looking. So, like, every, I, I guess every man is just weak around her. So then Sean is kind of like, okay, this is cool. Now now I get it. Kazuya is in this, like, sticky situation. He's He also, like, like uh, Mizuhara is also a uh, rental girlfriend. So then that's cool. And then they, they share, like, a moment, like, Kazuya is in the back um, during, like, the date, and then, like, they, they make up, apologize. They, they like, um, talk about, like, the girls' bodies and stuff, you know, guy shit. And then it, also his date with uh, Mizuhara kind of inspires him to get his own girlfriend. So I guess, like, this is a good experience because now he's going to better himself, like, work on hygiene, like, maybe work out. Maybe he's going to be a Chad like two episodes later or next arc and then we see him like with his own girlfriend but but yeah like it's, it's a cool kind of uh, makeup wholesome episode for the guy shun 
you know, he needed that uh, morale boost. And at the end, we have uh, Mizuhara ask um, Kazuya for a favor. He's like, she's like, oh, I know this girl. She's a rental girlfriend, but she's really bad. She's so shy that people are complaining how shy she is. So can she go on a date with you? Like, like if we're free, of course. And then you just, like, kind of help her practice. And then this is this is interesting, because we're on episode 10. There's only two more episodes left. And this is, like, the final girl of, like, the of the harem, I guess, where we get the, um, like, the first girl, which is Mizuhara. Uh, second girl is uh, Mami, which is the ex. Third girl, Ruka, with the blue ribbon. And the fourth girl is the, is Sumi. So she is, she's the shy girl. And yeah, probably, she probably is going to join the harem, so it's, it's, all, it's about time. It's only a matter of time. Okay, now for Uzaki. Uzaki wants to hang out episode 10. So Uzaki and Sakurai go on some island trip together. This episode was basically the slice of life, fist slice of life ever. Nothing really happened, but it was like a lot of stuff happened in the island itself. But uh, nothing to advance the plot. So it was just like a wholesome island adventure. Uzaki kind of uh, has a competition with uh, Sakurai where they um, see some big sand dunes. And Uzaki's like, oh, last one at the end owes, each, owes the other one an ice cream. So then, um, you know, you see Sakurai running. You think he's win he'll win because he's the most athletic dude. But then Uzaki kind of cheats. She just has, like, this sandboard that she rented and a helmet. And she just, like, zooming down the the, hills, the sand dunes. But then um, she gets fucked because of the momentum stops at the at the bottom. So then she has to run the last few uh, few feet. But then that's when Sakurai ca catches up because Uzaki is not really athletic. And then after that, um, oh yeah, Ami, Ami Chan, and the blonde dude also like tag along on the date. They're just spectating like us all. So then they they travel together. Um, they're in the island name is Totori Island. There's a lot of couples there, so it's like a couple focused island, which is kind of like they get they get embarrassed like damn. And then, um, they, they do stuff, they eat these rabbit cakes, Uzaki's like, no, don't eat me, I'm a rabbit. So then Sakurai kind of gets uncomfortable trying to eat it. And then, um, they go to a museum together. There, it's like a manga and figurine museum, actually, which I thought was pretty cool. Like, I paused the, um, episode, try to see if there's some, any nandroids that I actually, like, recognize. I, I kind of really, though, so they're probably just, uh, just a random, uh, fill-in, uh, figures. That, that have no, like, affiliation. They also go to a shrine together, a couple's resort, where we get a quick onsen scene, which was, like, I, I was pretty inspect unexpected, uh, a fucking hot spring scene this quick. Like, okay. But then, yeah, um, other than that, everything wraps up in a cool uh, island trip to Totori Island, and then... Um, next episode we'll probably get more wholesome or more teasing depending on like I guess what the what the manga goes for also I wanted to talk about two more ongoing animes that are kind of seasonals but uh, they're they're ongoing like um, the 24 episode shows basically or 25 26 so, um, this one is Fruits Basket, episode 23, where, uh, I love Fruits Basket, it's so wholesome and nice, and just cozy, even though there's, like, some dark undertones that are happening, but yeah, for Fruits Basket, um, there's, like, their whole Cinderella play, where it's not really Cinderella, it's, like, a remix of, of whatever they want to do. The typical jokes are there, um, the dark, the... The black wearing a wave girl is like the she's playing Cinderella wearing a black dress all depressed and stuff, and then her family's there to support her. Toru and Rio have a moment where Toru is playing the evil stepsister, but like you know she's not she can't she's not that evil, she's just uh you know wholesome Toru, but then she's on the side of the on the play, and then um Cinderella's kind of baiting baiting um Rio. Because Rio is playing the prince, and then Cinderella's like, "Oh, you wanna, you wanna be locked up in a tower forever?" Like she, she's, she's doing some like, uh, 
second wall breaking because it's like the it's like their third wall but then it's so she's breaking the third wall there not the fourth wall because then that'd be us but it's like a third wall break for her and then um uh toru kind of instinctively says no don't uh don't get locked in a tower forever etc so they kind of have like some romantic uh chemistry going on also yuki um he he tells uh because yuki is the fairy godmother so he tells um kyo to well he tells ryo to basically like make his wish with his own power i'm not granting you your wish you have to do your wish with your own power so then that's that's kind of implying that just the uh, ryo has to just man up and ask toru out go out together he's, he's trying to ship them because uh that's that's his mom right there so then um the other one i want to talk about was railgun a certain scientific railgun t episode 23 and then this anime was going on for so long it's just like do the every pause and everything i i just i just love this arc the dream ranker arc it's just like so fun and nice everything is just amazing so then um misaka teams up with leader um i remember the last episode she was fighting the she was fighting the other girl from scavenger and then she beats her pretty easily so then she teams up with leader leader is like kind of scared that oh i have to not piss off the level the level five role she'll beat my ass um they have a good comedy together she leader gives misako like kind of a communication device which is like the uh gecko to green frog so then um that's cool they work together to track down the doppelganger and then like her her skill is very important because it's easy to track she can just like stalk anyone she wants um other members of the of the um scavenger team work together to evacuate a building of skill out people but then doppelganger gets super strong she, he, she just absorbs like stuff from her like injured arm she has like this big cobblestone arm and she's just transforming into like this big golem misaka tries to fight it she does a good job but then um you know it just absorbs so much like her 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 try to fight strategy is that like oh you can absorb stuff but i can destroy it and it'll burn so like you know she can destroy her like but then it is just a match matter of speed of destruction versus speed of uh, regeneration also misaka can only like um affect things with iron in them while the doppelganger can um affect things like anything so there's that's one disadvantage she has also scavenger also leaves they kind of uh i don't know if they betray they'll probably come back but then they're like peace i did my job i'm out so and there we go for real good